Hi, so I wanted to talk about the design principles of uh, wind generators. Now, in their essence, they're actually extremely simple. I mean, don't get me wrong, they can get very complicated when you go really into it. But at their very basics, there's actually not a lot to it. And you have to think about that a little bit when it comes to designing your wind turbine and what it is that you're going to do when you're going around building one. Because a wind turbine has three essential components. It's got the rotor, which is the bladed bit that catches the wind. It's got the generator, which is the bit that converts that into electricity. And then it's got the tower where it all sits on so you can poke it up into the wind. Now the generator is actually just essentially this, this is a DC motor. The job of the rotor is to turn that. It has to turn that with a certain amount of force at a certain speed and that will generate. Now we're going to do another video on selecting motors as generators because it, again it's another one of those things that is simple but gets a bit complicated so we'll have a look at that in a different video. In this one we're looking at the rotor, the bit that is responsible for turning that. And that's the whole job of the rotor. Now if I take a lump of wood like this out on a windy day, the wind is going to push that and I'm going to be able to feel it. If I hold that in the wind I'll feel that pushing against me. That's not a very big bit of wood, but actually it's about the same size as a blade in the old American West with those pump windmills that you saw absolutely everywhere. But the wind will push on that flat surface and you'll be able to feel it pushing against you. If you take a great big bit, a bit of 8 before or 2.4 by 1.2 metres on a windy day, you're likely to take off. You're not going to be able to hold that because that push is very much stronger. The push is actually proportional to the area. So the bigger the area, the harder you feel the push. And we have all know that if you try to hang a bed sheet up in a windy day, it's a bit of a struggle. If you hang it up on a still day, it's a piece of cake. So we all know that intuitively. The bigger the area, the harder that push. Now I'm referring it to as push, but it can be push or lift. It's just a, a good way of looking at it is as push. So you get a sense that the wind has a certain amount of power. And that wind power is dependent on how hard the wind is blowing and how big that area is that you're trying to hold up in that blowing wind. That's the amount of power that's actually available. Now, of course, there is no more power available. That's it. If you have those two factors, then you are going to get a certain amount of push. The amount of push that you get is proportional to the efficiency of the thing. So if I've got a wind coming straight at me, and I hold that in front of it, it's quite a lot of push. If I do that with it, there's not much at all, because I've reduced the surface area. So clearly, if I design a wind turbine blade where it's pointing that way in the wind, it's going to be pretty inefficient. If I point it that way in the wind, I'm going to get a greater efficiency, because I can capture more of the push. And that's what rotor design is all about. Rotor design is about capturing as much push as you can get and converting that into the turning force that this requires. So when you're designing rotors, asking how many watts that outputs, how many amps, how many volts is actually meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. When you're looking at rotors, the two things that you're looking at really are the speed at which it goes and the amount of push that it has when it's turning around in a circle. Now push turning in a circle is called torque. So we're interested in two aspects when it comes to rotor design. The speed at which it turns and the torque at which it turns. Because that torque is a turning force. Now, when I hold this and try to turn that, you can feel the resistance that it has to wanting to turn. Now, this has actually got a very low resistance. I can feel that just because I can spin it easily by my hand. I've got a treadmill motor here. This is a treadmill motor, it's a DC motor. This requires a lot more push to get it going. And again, I can feel it just in my hand, how much push that needs. That turning force, the torque, the starting torque, to get that to go is the minimum that we actually require from our rotor design. So our rotor design has to turn with enough force to turn this, otherwise, it won't convert the en a wind energy into electrical energy. Obviously, we can't turn that. We're going to get nothing out of here. So the primary consideration we have is not the number of volts and amps that a rotor will do, because that doesn't mean anything. 
It's the speed and torque at which it will turn. Now, speed and torque uh, can be calculated from first principles, or you can use an online calculator to give you those without having to worry too much about what those uh, equations actually are. Or you can model it. You can use uh, an element analysis modeling system and model what it should be. Or you can test it. You can take it out into the wind and you can measure the wind speed and measure the speed of turn and measure the torque that it generates. Now, I'm a practical guy. That's what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in measuring those things rather than calculating them. I will calculate them because it gives me a theoretical amount of talk that can be generated and that's what those online calculators do they give you a theoretical limit of what it is that you can actually get now in terms of the rows what we actually calculate using the online calculators and i use omni calculator incidentally is 0 0.25 newton meter at 500 rpm that's its theoretical torque and speed and that is a target figure for looking at how efficient your design is. If you want to know how efficient your design is against what the theoretical design limit is going to be, an online calculator is awesome for that job. And it can tell you what it is that your ballpark figure is. When you're designing your particular rotor and you measure that RPM and you measure that torque on the shaft, that can be compared directly to what the theoretical limit is to give you an idea of the efficiency of the rotor that you've designed or the rotor that you're trying to use. Now, measuring um, RPM, <laughs> you see, you just put an RPM meter at it, you'll measure it. Measuring torque is a little bit more difficult. There are Now, torque, as it happens, splits into two bits. There's static torque and dynamic torque. Static torque is the amount of turning force that is in balance, and it's dead easy to measure. Just get yourself a rod, bolt it onto your shaft, have a weighing scale underneath, and when it tries to turn, it'll press on that scale and give you a gram reading. And of course, you'll know the length of your rod, and so you can work out the newton meters. But of course, motors are actually done while they're turning. And if you have a look at a graph of the torque of a motor, you'll see it's done in terms of torque over speed. So we need some way of measuring it while it's actually turning. Now, you can buy a torque sensor. They're a little expensive. Or you can make yourself something called a prony brake. Now, prony brakes aren't that difficult to make. And once you have one of those, you can measure the rotational speed and the, uh, the torque as the thing moves. If anybody's interested, actually, then I'm quite happy to do a video on making a prony brake. So using that information that we've got on the dynamic torque and the actual power available in the wind from the wind speed as you measure it, we can work out the efficiency of the rotor. That is what power that rotor is actually generating as a rotor. And that's what we really want when it comes to rotor design, because the combination of rotor to generator is yet another step. When we're interested in what that rotor is doing, what we're looking is at is the amount of power that rotor can capture in relation to the wind, not the amount of volts and amps it puts out. That's a step down the line when we consider generators. When we're considering our rotor design, we're really interested in how much power that rotor can capture as mechanical energy. We've not yet transferred it to electrical energy, because we're using the mechanical energy of the wind to mechanically turn a rotor, and we need to know what that mechanical transformation is, how efficient it is. So for that, we don't need amps and volts at this stage, we need speed and So the torque. people involved in wind turbine design, well, they basically fall into two camps. You find all the people who are interested in that mechanical capture of the wind energy, rotor side of the design of the turbine, and then a whole bunch of people who are interested in the generator side of design. So when you look at the generator side, you see all those things like axial flux generators, interesting designs like switch reluctance, that sort of stuff. Because they're looking at that mechanical to electrical energy conversion part of it and the efficiency of that and how well that can do it. Whereas things like the power pod and shrouded um, windmill designs, uh, the uh, vertical tunnels where they capture the wind and put it through a vertical tunnel, all of those are looking at the mechanical side of it, how best to capture as much of the wind energy as you possibly can. Now, it's obviously um, the cube of the wind speed, so increasing in wind speed is something people look at. The, um, effective capture area so when you have a, a turbine that big we make the effective area that big then obviously you're capturing more in, in inverted commas of the wind and you see designs focusing on that sort of stuff 
So the shroud designs all focus on that because that's one of the key elements of it. Of course, the rose design focuses on that by having an effective aperture greater than its actual aperture. And the power pod design is something very similar as well. There are some other interesting designs that look at capturing buffeting winds from different directions, and you have some nice solutions there as well. But they're all looking at the effective capture of the mechanical energy of the wind in their rotor design. The coupling is just a straightforward coupling, and then you get a whole bunch of people looking at the generation side. Anyway, I thought I would cover that just as a first section. We'll deal with the other section in a later video. I hope it was of interest and thank you very much for watching. Please remember to subscribe.